Hello. In the next few minutes, you're going to hear something about what is happening on three Interreg 5A funded projects, Compass, MARPAM and C-Monitor, uh, and how those projects are, are contributing to our knowledge about SAL-MONID migration and about their space use and management. Hello, my name is Robert Rossell, and I'm a fishery scientist working for the Agri-Food and Biosciences Institute in Northern Ireland. My co-authors on this presentation are Richard Kennedy, also of AFI, and Willie Roach and James Barry of Inland Fisheries Ireland. I want to take about 10 minutes to give you an overview of a salmon and sea trout study underway as an element of the Compass project. We are tracking salmon and sea trout at sea using acoustic technology of transmitters and receiving listening stations. I want to take you through the who, what, where, when and why of the project um, as it applies to the coastal waters of the northeast of Ireland and give you a flavour of the results we've got so far and look forward to the next steps to complete the project. First of all, now I would like to give you an introduction to the project in a little more detail. First of all, the species concerned, we're talking about trout and, and salmon and this sea trout as opposed to the resident river trout. Brown trout and sea trout are effectively the same animal, uh, just that one part of the population decides to go and feed at sea and other, another part of the population is generally resident in the rivers. Quite what makes them do this has been a, a ground for a, a lot of speculation, but uh, it, the outcome is that we have effectively one species but two very different life strategies. Salmon are a little simpler. They uh, breed in fresh water and uh, the young fish grow in fresh water and then they go to the sea. We know that our salmon feed far to the north and go as far as the northern North Sea, Norwegian Sea and across to Greenland in, in some cases. But what we don't know is exactly what routes they take to get there. And that is important in the context of 30 years of population decline. And finding out where they go gives us a chance of informing management on what might be causing the marine um, increased mortality over that period. Once we know where they go, we have a chance to look for how they interact with other species, how inter other environmental changes in the ocean might be affecting them, and indeed if there are other human pressures out in those areas they're travelling through. Sea trout and salmon are effectively treated the same under UK and Irish law, and any large silverfish migrating inshore and going up a river is treated uh, as it were a salmon and called a salmon in, in some law. And this is now known not to be the best way of managing the two species. So providing information to allow future legal systems to separate the two and provide separate legal uh, cover to, to treat them and manage them separately uh, is obviously uh, required at this point in time. And indeed also to separate the sea trout from their resident brown trout face that, that don't leave the rivers. And it is important to, to reiterate that both species have declined over the past two decades, three decades. And there's been a lot of work on salmon describing the sea survival decline. The, the next big step is to try and understand exactly what has gone wrong and is there anything that we can do to restore our salmon stocks um, and even address the issues in the marine environment. Our work package objectives are focused around providing the eventual management information improvement that the project has to deliver. So our first one is to find out what habitats the, the fish use as they migrate from fresh water to sea. And this applies both to, to salmon 
and to see trout. The technology we're using is acoustics and in, in the fish, you implant a small acoustic transmitter. The one in this particular picture is a large transmitter for a, a salmon or sea trout of perhaps five pounds or more. And the acoustic receiving unit listening station is the size of a two liter water bottle. These can be placed in the sea, either fixed on moorings or on uh, a line or anywhere where there's a fixed structure you can tie it to or indeed in open water they can be put on an acoustic release which works away unnoticed until you come along with your acoustic control box on a boat and release it so it pops up and you need to get either unit tight back to collect the data and the map of these are the two species of where we're using um, in their smolt phase, which is the phase at which they leave the rivers. The top fish is a sea trout smolt and the bottom fish is an Atlantic salmon smolt. And both of these could carry a tag that is about seven millimeters in diameter with a length of perhaps a centimeter, which will transmit for six months, perhaps to a year, depending on how it's programmed, uh, while and then record as it passes the receivers and listening stations. And these we have placed in nearshore environments, bays, sea lochs, river estuaries. The first of these is about a kilometre out to sea from the River Boyne to Strangford Loch. There are a few actually north of the array in Belfast Loch as well. And these are initially designed to, to track sea trout around the coast. The network patches in to a wider array. Um, the same picture, the blue and yellow on this picture are the ones you've just seen. And the red ones are a wider network of receivers, part of the overall compass project, um, which are there and also other EU projects, which are oper opportunities where there are moorings for recording oceanographic or other factors such as whale and dolphin sound and where you can piggyback on these and put a receiver out on the same facilities so it gives us an extra field and these are these are perhaps more applied to the salmon and, look, and the numbers of fish to be tagged are a total of um, nearly 700 fish for the whole study in batches of 30 or more to make some kind of statistical sense of the results. On to the marine life of sea trout. And um, the first thing you need to do is to catch your fish. And we have various means of getting hold of them. We can use various designs of trap. We can use uh, electric fishing. But we've also discovered that by working with angling clubs, and particularly, you know, there are some expert anglers out there who are able to catch these fish very uh, cleanly with small light tackle, and, and um, they're on the line for perhaps half a minute before they're in a bucket and ready to be worked through, measured and checked as to whether they're suitable for carrying a tag. We've had some really good interactions and help from citizen science anglers, both in County Down and County Louth to help us catch the sea trout. And when we have tagged these things and released them to go to sea, we're beginning to see some very wide ranging and different behaviours. The top one of these slides is a sea trout released from the Castletown River, which uh, entered into Dundalk Bay and more or less stayed there, swam around Dundalk Bay for a while until we saw it on no further detections. The next fish down was a fish um, released from the Shimna River, Newcastle County Down, and then it decided to track down along the coast, spent some time in Dundalk Bay, and then went to the Boyne Estuary where it fed for a while in the summer. And then a third fish did ex came from the castle town and did more or less the exact, exact opposite, went north, fed around Dundrum Bay, Newcastle Bay, Ardglass, and then turned back south and went back to its home river in that autumn. So the fish don't really uh, 
observe any borders, and particularly the smolt and finnock life stages seem to have extensive coastal movements. There are some hotspots in here, and these, this is an obvious hotspot, and these are the estuaries the fish are released from, from Castle Town and the Shimna, and they differ a bit in how the estuaries are configured. The longer and, and more extensive the estuary, the, perhaps the longer the fish will hang around before deciding to go offshore or go alongshore. And the Shimna comes off over a directly over a beach into the sea and the fish have to disperse quite quickly and the Boyne and the, and the Castletown River might disperse a little bit more slowly before taking their, their longshore migrations. Other hotspots are where they go to feed and we've identified feeding hotspots in the mouths of Carlingford Loch, the Boyne Estuary and indeed in Dundrum Bay just north of Newcastle. The next question, moving on from sea trout onto salmon, is where and what route do the salmon take to get out of the Irish Sea? We already know that they go north and feed in the Norwegian Sea and in, in some of our fish even to West Greenland. But what route do they take from that middle portion of the Irish Sea to go there? And the question has always been, do they go north or do they go south? And this project has given us some insight, at least, into some of those fish. You've seen perhaps the paper published in Fisheries Management and Ecology last year, which uh, was came from the, the tracks of three of our first salmon to uh, be tracked at sea. The first thing to notice is that these fish don't appear on the coastal network at all. They seem to go offshore much more quickly, head for deep water. And these three fish were all on receivers, perhaps a couple of kilometers for the one on the left, off St. John's Point offshore, out on the Copeland Islands. So again, the limit of our coastal network. And the final one, amazingly, given that 400 meter range, it might be detected at sea, left the Boyne and was, was noticed heading west out towards the Atlantic, uh, but on middle bank halfway between the north of Ireland and Isla. So we're, we really are um, testing the bounds of the technology in terms of finding the migration routes. Taking that success on into 2020, um, we then decided to put a, an array of acoustic release receivers across the North Channel from Larne to Scotland. And we didn't perhaps pick the best year to do it in that the coronavirus restrictions re restricted some of the fish tagging and early season activity. But we did manage to get fish out of the Boyne. And also on the other side of the water, we, there were projects going between uh, the UK Environment Agency, uh, Glasgow University partners under the Sea Monitor project, and um, Atlantic Salmon Trust and various other, various other sponsors active. And this array picked up fish moving from all those projects, from Compass and from the Cumbrian Derwent and the River Endrick, which is a, a, a Clyde tributary. So there's a lot of data here to be analyzed and detections to be, to be thought over and seeing what exactly are all the fish doing. We plan to take this a notch up next year. And with the sea monitor project spinning up further to our north, some of these fish might have a double gate to go through and give us even more information on the timing and tracking. And we might even, because of tagging to the north, find if any of the fish are even moving south. So lots of lots to play for. And this is our plan for next spring and early summer is to really beef up this particular data set on, on salmon at sea. And finally, to return to the sea trout, we have um, more to do in terms of documenting the survival rates of sea trout from smolt leaving the river to finnock, which is the first stage at which they appear back in the autumn in estuaries. And finally, to the, the full-blown spawning fish, which come in um, after, sometimes after one winter at sea in November or even perhaps yeah, late summer to, to November most years. 
Hello, my name is Colin Adams. I'm from the University of Glasgow. What I'm going to do uh, in the next few minutes is to add to what Robert has just been telling you by describing what is happening uh, in the Sea Monitor project, which is working alongside Compass and MARPAM um, and sharing information. Sea Monitor is a big project, a big ambitious project, which has nine uh, partners. Those partners have logos on the screen at the moment. I'm not going to read them all out to you. The project itself um, is trying to, uh, is funded by Interreg 5A um, and it's working in the seas of Northern Ireland, Ireland and the west coast of Scotland. And what it's doing is looking at space use by a number of important high conservation value, high management value species basking shark and skate, seals and cetaceans. But what I'm here to talk to you about is the salmon work that is involved in the Sea Monitor project. Robert has very nicely set the scene for why salmonids are important. Their populations are in decline, they're economically important, and they're of high conservation value. So why are these populations in decline? Well, we know that there's a number of potential pressures that may be impacting on those species um, at the moment. The first that I wanted to say something about is, is predation. Predation is, is, is a potential impact on our populations of sea trout and, and salmon. Um, yet we, we know very little about how big that pressure is, what the magnitude of effect is, and whether it's significantly large enough to have a major impact on populations. We know in some parts of the world, mostly because of studies in Norway, that it is having an effect, but we actually don't know very much about our coastal seas and how big predation may be um, in terms of its impact on populations. A second potential pressure comes from the very rapid increase in aquaculture that we've seen particularly on the west coast of Scotland and Ireland over the last three decades or so. Aquaculture, fish farming for uh, Atlantic salmon has grown remarkably uh, and along with that growth has come a number of potential pressures on our wild populations. Those pressures take a number of forms but the one that is most concerning is uh, the impact that may occur from sea lice emanating from fish farms uh, affecting our wild migrating smolts. The arrow there on that small smolt shows a sea louse, which you can see is relatively large uh, relative to the size of the smolt. And on fish farms where fish are held at high densities, we know that um, sea lice um, do increase in abundance and we do know that um, lice from sea farms have the, it, p the potential to infect and therefore affect um, smolts as they swim past, as they migrate out to sea, uh, thereby causing a, a, a pressure on our salmonid population. A third potential pressure that may well be operating on our salmon and sea trout smolts as they migrate into coastal waters uh, comes from offshore developments of tidal energy and uh, offshore wind turbines. This is uh, an area of um, development which is rapidly increasing um, over the last few years and will continue to increase over the next two or three decades. It involves putting structures into our coastal zones to trap this tidal energy or capture, uh, capture wind and, and generate electricity from it. However, we know very little about what impact this might have on migrating salmon smolts as they migrate into the coastal zone, simply because we don't know where um, they are migrating. We don't know their migration routes. So at this stage, we're unable to suggest places where it might make sense to put these structures in our coastal zones to avoid the impact that there might be on salmon smolts. So how is the Sea Monitor project going to contribute knowledge that will help protect salmon and 
sea trout. Well, one of the things that the Sea Monitor Project is going to do is to assess uh, migration patterns across the west coast of Scotland, Ireland and Northern Ireland. And by that I mean uh, we want to attempt to identify the migration routes, particularly that salmon are taking as they migrate through the coastal zones and out to sea. We want to work out the duration of that migration. So, so uh, over what period of time are these fish migration, migrating? And uh, that will help us work out um, how vulnerable they are to activities which are being conducted in the coastal zone. And at least for some parts of the migration, we want to be able to determine the survival rate. What is the survival rate of, of these small fish as they're migrating out into the coastal waters and then ultimately out into the open ocean? If we can identify uh, patterns of mortality, for example, where the mortality may be at its highest, then we should be able to narrow down what kinds of pressures are having what kind of effect on our migrating salmon populations. Also, um, we want to compare between rivers. We already know that different rivers have different migration successes. The fish from those um, different rivers show different patterns of migration success. Some rivers show high migration success and others relatively low. What's causing those differences? Can we start to use the Sea Monitor Project to pick apart what kinds of uh, impacts may be operating in one river that are not operating in another river? And of course, we know that some fish are successful at migrating and others are not successful at migrating. Can we pinpoint the kinds of characteristics that make for a successful migrant? Is there some aspect of their phenotype, their morphology, for example, um, or are they genetically different in some way, the successful ones compared with the unsuccessful ones? The end result is we want to take all, all this novel data that we'll gather as part of the Sea Monitor project and uh, combine that with uh, information that is known from the studies elsewhere and we'll, we'll, we'll put that into a management plan um, specifically directed towards managing salmon in the Clyde estuary and managing salmon in the River Foyle. So how is the Sea Monitor project uh, going to operate? Well, um, one element of the Sea Monitor project will um, collect fish at a number of sites around Ireland, Northern Ireland and Scotland, Barishul, the Foyle, the Bush, uh, and two sites in the western part of Scotland, the River Endrick, which drains ultimately into the Clyde, and the Greif, which drains into the, the main stem of the Clyde. All of these sites have salmon populations which are large enough for us to be able to capture some fish and tag some fish and look at the migration pathways. And we'll do that during the, the normal smolt migration period, which is in April and May. And we'll capture the fish uh, using rotary screw traps or fike nets in some cases. Uh, and in one or two places, we'll be able to use uh, existing uh, trapping facilities like wolf traps, which are already in place to trap salmon smolts. Once we've captured the fish, uh, we can implant uh, a small acoustic transmitter. Robert's already covered this a little bit. Those, and as the fish swims out to sea, then those transmitters are picked up by fixed location receivers. Uh, and we can see one on the right hand side here. As they pass, they're detected. We know where the fish are and we can tell how fast it's migrating from one uh, receiver to the next receiver. We began work on Sea Monitor in 2020 which is, of course, the very worst year to attempt to go out and, and try and execute a very ambitious project like this one, because, of course, COVID uh, restriction reg regulations made it virtually impossible to get out and do any coastal marine work. So rather than sit idle, we decided that we would um, adjust some elements of the project to test some of the questions that we want to test in the marine environment uh, in 
into our waters. And in this case, uh, we were able to tag on the west coast of Scotland 125 salmon smolts that were migrating down the River Endrick, heading for the open sea. But in, on their way to the open sea, they have to pass through a large lake, Loch Lomond. And that um, passage gave us an opportunity to test certain kinds of questions that relate to how salmon find their way uh, in relatively large bodies of water, as they do in coastal zones, um, how they migrate through those large bodies of water um, without obvious directional cues that come from um, passing water with, without a, a water flow that they have in rivers. And so to do that, we tagged our fish in the River Endrick, which drains into Loch Lomond, and we covered the southern part of Loch Lomond with static receivers. Now, we've only just got those static receivers back, but and, and so we don't have any data yet, but um, we are hoping that, that uh, those receivers will give us data that will allow us to draw some inferences about how salmon are migrating in, in standing waters, um, what kinds of cues they're using, how accurate their navigation is, and how successful they are at migrating are the kinds of questions we ought to be able to address in this, um, this, this, this project, which took a life of its own only because of COVID. One of the most ambitious parts of the Sea Monitor project, um, which complements uh, work which is being done in other Interreg funded projects, is this uh, very long uh, array of receivers, which uh, will uh, stretch from Mallon Head um, on Ireland up to uh, Isla off the west coast of Scotland. That array will allow us to detect salmon smolts as, they, as it migrates through that curtain of receivers and will give us information on how fast they're traveling in marine uh, waters, what direction they're taking, and, and crucially, um, how many survive. But the Sea Monitor project is not the only project that is operational. We've heard a little bit about Compass uh, already from Robert, but there is a, a, another big project which is operating on the west coast of, of Scotland, funded by Scottish government, which uh, involves a collaboration between the Atlantic Salmon Trust and the University of Glasgow. And these red marks on this uh, map on the right hand side shows where there will be marine receivers um, put into the water. Um, one particular one which stretches from Uist to uh, Sky is going to effectively block off the minch and it means that any fish that's passing through the minch should be detectable. But there will be a number of other marine arrays uh, around the Hebrides uh, and up off the west coast of, of Sutherland. In total in this project there will be tagging done at uh, six river sites around the west coast of Scotland and many of these river sites will um, be tagging fish which uh, may well pass through the Malin Head to Isla array of the Sea Monitor project. In addition to that project, there's a, another project that uh, the University of Glasgow, in, in collaboration with the Environment Agency, is, is running. And this is a tagging project on salmon from the River Derwent, which is in uh, West Cumbria. The River Derwent's a large dendritic river. It has a large salmon population, um, but that salmon population, as with others, has been going into decline. Um, in 2020, and again for another two years, we'll be tagging 100 fish in this project um, and looking at their migration success as they migrate through river stages of their migration, but then also as they move out to sea. And of course, the, if these fish are going north, they'll go up through the North Channel and hopefully through the Malin Head to Isla Array um, of the Sea Monitor project. So there are an enormous number of synergies across projects, across MARPAM, Compass and Sea Monitor projects, but also across the University of Glasgow AST project on the West Coast and the University of Glasgow's project uh, on the Derwent River in, in Cumbria. 
And we're already starting to see some signs of exciting synergies which are coming across multiple projects. Uh, and so I, I want to just identify a couple of those. From the salmon smolts that we managed to tag in the River Endrick um, in Loch Lomond in 2020, um, we've already detected one of those fish on a marpam receiver, which is down in the very far edge of the outer uh, firth of Clyde, um, just off the Mull of Kintyre, a considerable distance away from the tagging site, about 80 kilometres. And we now know the marine migration time. It took about 30 days for the fish to get um, from the point at which it entered um, the marine environment out to this, this marpam site. Robert has already mentioned the, the compass array, which um, stretches between Northern Ireland uh, and Scotland, between uh, Larne and Port Patrick. Um, that compass array has, has already detected a, a number of salmon smolts. It's detected two which were uh, tagged in the River Endrick in 2020, um, and they've travelled uh, over 148 kilometres once they'd entered seawater to get there, taking between three and ten days, um, a really fast rate of, of migration. And um, it, that same array has also detected two salmon smolts that came from the River Derwent project in, uh, in Cumbria. So we're already starting to see some very considerable synergies across interreg funded projects, but also projects that stand outside um, interreg where we have uh, collaborations between, between those projects and, and us. And we certainly uh, suspect that this is the first of, of many synergies we're going to see over um, the next couple of years of work in Seamonitor. In conclusion, uh, I wish to thank and acknowledge the funders, the EU Interreg 5A programme run through the Special EU Programmes Body, which has given us the resources and opportunity to take on a project at a scale which would otherwise simply not have been possible. Thank you.